Chapter 4 The memory was like a knife cutting into him, slicing deep into him with hate. The Secret He had been riding his 10-speed with a friend named Terry. They had been taking a run on a bike trail and decided to come back a different way, a way that took them past the Amber Mall. Brian remembered everything in incredible detail, remembered the time on the bank clock in the mall, flashing 331, then the temperature, 82, and the date. All the numbers were part of the memory. All of his life was part of the memory. Terry had just turned to smile at him about something, and Brian looked over Terry's head and saw her, his mother. She was sitting in a station wagon, a strange wagon. He saw her, and she did not see him. Brian was going to wave or call out, but something stopped him. There was a man in the car. Short blonde hair the man had, wearing some kind of white pullover tennis shirt. Brian saw this and more, saw the secret, and saw more later, but the memory came in pieces, came in scenes like this. Terry smiling, Brian looking over his head to see the station wagon, and his mother sitting with the man. The time and temperature clock, the front wheel of his bike, the short blonde hair of the man, the white shirt of the man. The hot hate slices of the memory were exact. The secret. Brian opened his eyes and screamed. For seconds, he did not know where he was, only that the crash was still happening and he was going to die, and he screamed until his breath was gone. Then silence, filled with sobs as he pulled in air, half crying. How could it be so quiet? Moments ago, there was nothing but noise, crashing and tearing, screaming, now quiet. Some birds were singing. How could birds be singing? His legs felt wet, and he raised up on his hands and looked back down at them. They were in the lake. Strange. They went down into the water. He tried to move, but pain hammered into him and made his breath shorten into gasps, and he stopped, his legs still in the water. Pain. Memory. He turned again, and sun came across the water. Late sun cut into his eyes and made him turn away. It was over then. The crash. He was alive. The crash is over, and I am alive, he thought. Then his eyes closed, and he lowered his head for minutes that seemed longer. When he opened them again, it was evening, and some of the sharp pain had abated. There were many dull aches. And the crash came back to him fully, into the trees and out onto the lake. The plane had crashed and sunk in the lake, and he had somehow pulled free. He raised himself and crawled out of the water, grunting with the pain of movement. His legs were on fire, and his forehead felt as if somebody had been pounding on it with a hammer. But he could move. He pulled his legs out of the lake and crawled on his hands and knees until he was away from the wet, soft shore and near a small stand of brush of some kind. Then he went down only this time to rest, to save something of himself. He lay on his side and put his head on his arm and closed his eyes, because that was all he could do now, all he could think of being able to do. He closed his eyes and slept, dreamless, deep, and down. There was almost no light when he opened his eyes again. The darkness of night was thick, and for a moment he began to panic again. To see, he thought, to see is everything, and he could not see. But he turned his head without moving his body and saw that across the lake the sky was a light gray, that the sun was starting to come up. And he remembered that it had been evening when he went to sleep. Must be morning now, 
he mumbled, almost in a hoarse whisper. As the thickness of sleep left him, the world came back. He was still in pain, all over pain. His legs were cramped and drawn up, tight and aching, and his back hurt when he tried to move. Worst was a keening throb in his head that pulsed with every beat of his heart. It seemed that the whole crash had happened to his head. He rolled on his back and felt his sides and his legs, moving things slowly. He rubbed his arms. Nothing seemed to be shattered or even sprained all that badly. When he was nine, he had plowed his small dirt bike into a parked car and broken his ankle had to wear a cast for eight weeks, and there was nothing now like that, nothing broken, just battered around a bit. His forehead felt massively swollen to the touch, almost like a mound out over his eyes, and it was so tender that when his fingers grazed it, he nearly cried. But there was nothing he could do about it, and like the rest of him, it seemed to be bruised more than broken. I'm alive, he thought. I'm alive. It could have been different. There could have been death. I could have been done. Like the pilot, he thought suddenly. The pilot in the plane, down into the water, down into the blue water, strapped in the seat. He sat up, or tried to. The first time he fell back, but on the second attempt, Grunting with the effort, he managed to come to a sitting position and scrunched sideways until his back was against a small tree, where he sat facing the lake, watching the sky get lighter and lighter with the coming dawn. His clothes were wet and clammy, and there was a faint chill. He pulled the torn remnants of his windbreaker, pieces really, around his shoulders and tried to hold what heat his body could find. He could not think, could not make thought patterns work right. Things seemed to go back and forth between reality and imagination, except that it was all reality. One second, he seemed only to have imagined that there was a plane crash, that he had fought out of the sinking plane and swum to shore, that it had all happened to some other person or in a movie playing in his mind. Then he would feel his clothes, wet and cold, and his forehead would slash a pain through his thoughts and he would know it was real, that it had really happened, but all in a haze, all in a haze world. So he sat and stared at the lake, felt the pain come and go in waves, and watched the sun come over the end of the lake. It took an hour, perhaps two, He could not measure time yet and didn't care for the sun to get halfway up. With it came some warmth, small bits of it at first, and with the heat came clouds of insects, thick swarming hordes of mosquitoes that flocked to his body, made a living coat on his exposed skin, clogged his nostrils when he inhaled, poured into his mouth when he opened it to take a breath. It was not possibly believable not this. He had come through the crash, but the insects were not possible. He coughed them up, spat them out, sneezed them out, closed his eyes, and kept brushing his face, slapping and crushing them by the dozens, by the hundreds. But as soon as he cleared a place, as soon as he killed them, more came, thick, whining, buzzing masses of them, mosquitoes and some small black flies he had never seen before, all biting, chewing, taking from him. In moments, his eyes were swollen shut and his face puffy and round to match his battered forehead. He pulled the torn pieces of his windbreaker over his head and tried to shelter in it, but the jacket was full of rips and it didn't work. In desperation, he pulled his t-shirt up over his face, but that exposed the skin of his lower back and the mosquitoes and flies attacked the new soft flesh of his back so viciously that he pulled the shirt down. In the end, he sat with the windbreaker pulled up, brushed with his hands, and took it, almost crying in frustration and agony. There was nothing left to do, and when the sun was fully up and heating him directly, bringing steam off of his wet clothes and bathing him with warmth, 
the mosquitoes and flies disappeared. Almost that suddenly. One minute he was sitting in the middle of a swarm. The next, they were gone, and the sun was on him. Vampires, he thought. Apparently, they didn't like the deep of night, perhaps because it was too cool, and they couldn't take the direct sunlight. But in that gray time in the morning, when it began to get warm, and before the sun was full up and hot, he couldn't believe them. Never in all the reading, in the movies he had watched on television about the outdoors, never once had they ever mentioned the mosquitoes or flies. All they ever showed on the naturalist shows was beautiful scenery or animals jumping around, having a good time. Nobody ever mentioned mosquitoes and flies. Ugh! He pulled himself up to stand against the tree and stretched, bringing new aches and pains. His back muscles must have been hurt as well. They almost seemed to tear when he stretched. And while the pain in his forehead seemed to be abating somewhat, just trying to stand made him weak enough to nearly collapse. The backs of his hands were puffy, and his eyes were almost swollen shut from the mosquitoes. And he saw everything through a narrow squint. Not that there was much to see, he thought, scratching the bites. In front of him lay the lake, blue and deep. He had a sudden picture of the plane, sunk in the lake, down and down in the blue, with the pilot's body still strapped in the seat, his hair waving. He shook his head. More pain. That wasn't something to think about. He looked at his surroundings again. The lake stretched out slightly below him. He was at the base of the L, looking up the long part with the short part out to his right. In the morning light and calm, the water was absolutely, perfectly still. He could see the reflections of the trees at the other end of the lake. Upside down in the water, they seemed almost like another forest, an upside-down forest to match the real one. As he watched, a large bird, he thought it looked like a crow, but it seemed larger, flew from the top, real forest, and the reflection bird matched it, both flying out over the water. Everything was green, so green it went into him. The forest was largely made up of pines and spruce with stands of some low brush smeared here and there and thick grass and some other kind of very small brush all over. He couldn't identify most of it, except the evergreens, and some leafy trees he thought might be aspen. He'd seen pictures of aspens in the mountains on television. The country around the lake was moderately hilly, but the hills were small, almost hummocks, and there were very few rocks except to his left. There lay a rocky ridge that stuck out overlooking the lake, about 20 feet high. If the plane had come down a little to the left, it would have hit the rocks and never made the lake. He would have been smashed, destroyed. The word came. I would have been destroyed and torn and smashed, driven into the rocks and destroyed. Luck, he thought. I have luck. I had good luck there. But he knew that was wrong. If he had good luck, his parents wouldn't have divorced because of the secret, and he wouldn't have been flying with a pilot who had a heart attack, and he wouldn't be here where he had to have good luck to keep from being destroyed. If you keep walking back from good luck, he thought, you'll come to bad luck. He shook his head again, wincing. Another thing not to think about. The rocky ridge was rounded and seemed to be of some kind of sandstone with bits of darker stone layered and stuck into it. Directly across the lake from it, at the inside corner of the L 
was a mound of sticks and mud rising up out of the water a good eight or ten feet. At first, Brian couldn't place it, but knew that he somehow knew what it was, had seen it in films. Then a small brown head popped to the surface of the water near the mound and began swimming off down the short leg of the L, leaving a V of ripples behind, and he remembered where he'd seen it. It was a beaver house, called a beaver lodge in a special he'd seen on the public channel. A fish jumped. Not a large fish, but it made a big splash near the beaver, and as if by a signal, there was suddenly little splops all over the sides of the lake, along the shore, as fish began jumping. Hundreds of them, jumping and slapping the water. Brian watched them for a time, still in the half days, still not thinking well. The scenery was very pretty, he thought, and there were new things to look at, but it was all a green and blue blur, and he was used to the gray and black of the city, the sounds of the city, traffic, people talking, sounds all the time, the hum and whine of the city. Here, at first, it was silent, or he thought it was silent, but when he started to listen, really listen, he heard thousands of things, hisses and blurks, small sounds, birds singing, hum of insects, splashes from the fish jumping. There was great noise here, but a noise he did not know, and the colors were new to him and the colors and noise mixed in his mind to make a green-blue blur he could hear, hear as a hissing, pulsing sound, and he was still tired, so tired, so awfully tired, and standing had taken a lot of energy somehow, had drained him. He supposed he was still in some kind of shock from the crash, and there was still the pain, the dizziness, the strange feeling. He found another tree, a tall pine with no branches until the top, and sat with his back against it, looking down on the lake with the sun warming him. And in a few moments, he scrunched down and was asleep again. And that's the end of chapter four.